All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick, monitoring poly market uh, on a second by second <laughs> basis. We're not going to talk about the future of the free world today, though. We're going to talk about Dennis Allen uh, and the New Orleans Saints, and then we'll talk about Vikings Colts, the two teams who participated uh, in that Sunday night football game. We'll talk coach of the year and offensive player of the year. Uh, in the NFL, and then some early NBA impressions uh, and the Coach of the Year market there. But let's start off with Dennis Allen. Does this move the needle at all, Drew? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, well, he's now has a lot of free time to contemplate the future of the free world. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, it moves the needle a little, I think, because I didn't really especially love his fingerprints on the way that the defense was being coordinated recently. And uh, if this kind of opens up the opportunity for Clint Kubiak to continue to explore and grow and, you know, kind of get a little bit more, um, you know, hand, you know, have a little bit more of a, uh, an ownership of the offense. I've liked the returns that I've seen so far this season uh, when he's had those opportunities. So um, I don't really have a, a strong feeling of, uh, you know, whether D Joe Woods is going to be a, a, an upgrade in terms of kind of the principal master and vision of the uh, defense here. Um, Joe Woods has never really been a guy I've been all that enamored with. So uh, I think uh, this just kind of makes the saints a little bit more of a fun team um i'm curious to see like what are they like what do they do now <laughs> because the situation they found themselves in as a franchise is very unenviable and i would think that uh you know the the fact that they are pretty much married to Carr here at, at some point they're gonna have to make a decision about do you want to see more rattler have you seen enough <laughs> or is there opportunity to at least um maybe you get uh you know because there's a there's a modicum of an of an op, of a chance that uh rattler is your uh get out of jail free with all of the mistakes you've made handling your con your 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 um your salary cap and uh he's your uh your brock purdy so to speak uh down in the uh, in the big easy but um i you know i haven't seen enough to say that that's likely so far surely but uh, i think that the saints are probably going to want to uh, test that out a little bit there as as two and seven to this point in the season. Not only is that a huge disappointment, but it also takes them very much out of uh, the potential for uh, getting a wild card spot. So um, this is probably uh, you know a, 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 an opportunity to kind of explore the lower the the bottom of the roster, see what you got there, figure out how you're going to uh, develop moving forward. Uh, considering you're in cap jail with a quarterback who can't really do it anymore. Indeed. The uh, market has them now set at five and a half wins, um, which is a far cry from when they were wow. scoring on the first 15 drives of the season. Uh, and I was betting on them to win the NFC, which I'm starting to think <laughs> come home. Um, they're minus 130, the over five and a half. I don't think there's much meat on the bone here. Uh, I have them exactly at five and a half wins. So I don't think there's any bet to be made there. Um, perhaps there is a bet to be made on the Minnesota Vikings, who are now six and two, uh, coming off that uh, fairly unimpressive win, to be honest, against the Colts uh, in a game that was uh, a bit all over the place. Where Sam Darnold, as we mentioned on the previous show, uh, as I was reacting live, put on his Nick Mullins costume for a time, kind of removed it in the second half, and then kind of fleetingly put it back on for that pick. Uh, it was a bit, a bit of a mess, um, but they get the win. It's an uphill battle to win the NFC North because they're down a game in the loss column to the Lions and also down the first half of the tie break in kind of the, the worst half, given that the return game is in mm -hmm. Detroit in week 18, which if I had to bet, I think that game is probably not going to have stakes, given that I think the Lions might have it wrapped up by then. But uh, what did you make of the Vikings on Sunday night? Uh, and is there any way to bet this team? Uh, they're four-point favorites in Jacksonville on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, this is one of those unique opportunities where people who are just doing kind of box score headline stuff are going to see the numbers Sam Darnold put up, which were pretty impressive looking on a, as a single line and say, oh, the Darnold's still the guy that, uh, you know, can drive the ship to being, uh, you know, a, a team that should be three, four points better than an average on neutral. And then people who are digging in a little bit more would see his negative total EPA. The interception he threw was brutal. The fumble he had was brutal. And just in general, um, you know, he's, I think, a liability for this team, which is 
crazy to say out loud because he's been such an impressive step forward as far as what we've seen from him throughout his career this season. So um, he still is a guy that I would trust handily in the scripted portion of the offense to at least be efficient and move the ball. Um, he's got elite weapons to work with as we continue to see the emergence of Addison combined with uh, you know known awesome quantities uh, with the rest of that skill position group. So I think that... Um, there's probably an opportunity here to downgrade the quarterback position correctly based on what we have data wise, while the market might still be a little bit bullish on this team. Um, my current uh, outlook for the Vikings is 10.6 wins. Uh, I think uh, uh, I would make them right now 67% chance, chance to make the playoffs, only 16% uh, chance to win the division, largely because of what you mentioned, which is uh, the head-to-head loss against the Lions in Minnesota is bad news for them. Um, and um, <clears throat> if you want me to put on my uh, my NFL most fun prognosticating hat, um, we're going to see Sam Darnold and the Vikings head to Atlanta to take on Kirk Cousins and the Falcons in the wild card round of the playoffs, probably. And uh, that'll be a very fun game. Yeah, what will that be? Will that be pick? Uh, Falcons minus one? Oh, well, it's going to be influenced by the outcome of this uh, head-to-head that we have coming up between these teams. So there's going to be some, yeah, I think December 8th they play, I want to say. Uh, and uh, that'll, you know, the outcome of that game will affect that market. But uh, uh, as I currently price these teams i would think uh you would see atlanta minus one and a half ish um in atlanta and that's basically saying that there's very little margin between these two teams overall and i think that's actually pretty fair (laughs) they are quite similar with the exception of uh, a little bit more belief in brian flores being a good defensive coordinator uh and a little bit uh i think a little bit more confidence that kirk cousins would uh would not make the backbreaking mistake in that contest for the atlanta falcons so fun uh fun sort of um handicap if we get there and uh very excited for that december 12th or december 8th game indeed all right let's jump to the indianapolis colts my man joe flacco uh not super impressive in prime time the colts are now four and five uh they are plus 185 to make the playoffs minus 225 to miss they're 10 to 1 to win the afc south which is slipping away given that they have uh, the tiebreak uh, anti-clinched for them. Uh, the Texans beat them 2 nothing in the season series. They're projected to be about an eight-win team and they're four-and-a-half-point dogs uh, home to the Bills on Sunday. Um, what, what do you think happens here? Do you think that we see Anthony Richardson in the next two to three weeks again? I think so. <laughs> I don't think Flacco's the answer. <laughs> and I mean, it's one thing to say that off of a performance that was unimpressive from him, but uh, it's more just, I didn't really understand the move in the first place to go with Flacco other than uh, it seemingly was made to quell um, unrest in the locker room, I suppose, and keep uh, Shane Steichen in good favor with the uh, vets in this team who are trying to, uh, you know, win now. Um, it doesn't serve the Colts at all, I don't think, to keep Richardson on the shelf as opposed to getting him game time development. That's my been my opinion all along, and it doesn't change just based on the way Flacco played. If, if Flacco was great yesterday and the Colts you know, managed to win. Uh, I would be talking about them as a nine and a half win team instead of an eight and a half win team with a, oh, I don't know, uh, 10% chance to win a playoff game instead of a 2% chance to win a playoff game or something like that. But uh, the fact of the matter is 10 and 2% chance to win a playoff game does not warrant, I don't think, completely giving up on Richardson as a uh, developmental prospect. It's considering a, a, what we've seen from him in terms of his um, upside physically. So um, I think we're going to, get you know we're going to get an opportunity to see him again i don't know if it'll be this week it seems like they're going to at least give flacco two weeks to try to help sort of you know prove that they didn't make just a completely boneheaded decision there but um the buffalo bills are not uh necessarily the type of opponent you want to draw uh to sort of get that information so um this looks problematic for the colts um and yeah i think uh right now i have them teetering on um you know 35% 35% chance to make the playoffs. So another loss pretty squarely puts them in, you know, eliminated for all practical purposes category. Yeah. My my completely uninformed guess would be that uh, Flacco continues to kind of get thrown to the Wolves a little bit and plays Buffalo at the Jets, home Detroit. They're going to be material underdogs in all of those games. And then they have at the Patriots, um again outdoors be this december 1st might be some weather involved by that game patriots defense is perfectly well somewhat respectable 
and then they go to their buy and then i wonder if at that point if they've gone i mean the, the modal outcome there is probably going one and three, one and, three. and then you have five and eight and the season's pretty much done at that point even if they won't be mathematically eliminated and then you bring richardson back out of the buy and you give him four games to see if he is the the future or not and it's at denver home tennessee at the giants home the jags so some you know denver's defense is is solid but you know they're not terrifying matchups um those will all be very winnable games and then you have a yeah four game trial uh and then you can overreact to the small sample and then we can do the whole thing again to start next year with, <laughs> uh and bench him for whoever the backup is at that point so i suspect that might be how it goes it would seem such a radical shift back to go to bench Richardson, bring him back like this week, next week, whatever. Yeah, uh, I think they probably have to give Flacco a little bit of a run, which is kind of you shouldn't be tied to Joe Flacco. But um, yeah, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes there. I, can't, I imagine mm-hmm. it has to be something beyond just what he's putting out on the field between, um, you know, what he taking himself out of the game, and I think you know some of his press conferences weren't ideal either. So. That would be my best read on it, um, but I am merely speculating. By the way, before we move off of these two teams, um, one random thing of the Vikings is say that that last Week 18 game against the Lions is meaningless and Detroit have already clinched the division, the one seed, whatever they need to clinch, which is very much in play. Mm-hmm. There was a real chance the Vikings are favored in every single game the rest of the way, even if you only think that they're like, you know, two points better than your average team on neutral, mm-hmm. that type of range, they still may be favored in every single game, um, which is how easy or manageable that schedule is. And it's not like they have, like, you know, it's not like they're playing, like, the Panthers and the Raiders every week. It's just these games where it's, like, a lot of playing the Bears, where you're just slightly better than the Bears, but you will be a favorite in that one. So um, just an interesting quirk uh, around the Vikings. Uh, let's jump to the Coach of the Year market, where Kevin O'Connell featured prominently in for the first six or seven weeks of the season he's not done yet he's still the fourth favorite but i think this market has become well appropriately tiered in in some ways in other ways not uh dan quinn is the favorite at plus 180 he is the tier one by himself in the market and in my opinion in reality we have dan campbell sean payton seven to one at mgm koc andy reed eight to one harbour tomlin ten to one um, and then there's a drop off to Lafleur, who I think probably his realistic parts of the award probably ended uh, with that loss to the Lions. Uh, but what do you make of this market at the moment? Do you think there's any bet to be made? Oh man, I'm uh, a Dan Quinn supporter in uh, you know in spirit and in financial uh, incentive here, and I um, I'm looking over my shoulder at Dan Campbell and Andy Reid. Uh, doing some some superlative stuff with uh, just overall wins that they uh, could run down and catch Dan Quinn if he comes in as your twelve win five seed. Um, right now, I think uh, what he what Dan Quinn has done as the head coach at the Commanders, particularly developing this defense, is sh- nothing short of miraculous. <laughs> Like on paper, these guys should be your 30th best defense in the NFL heading into the season. And he's getting um, outstanding production, even in the absence of his most important player on the D-line, who's been out the last couple of weeks and Jonathan Allen. So this is crazy that they are as good as they are. And uh, you have to assume that this is not as much about opponent uh, strength, but more just Dan Quinn is a good defensive coach. <clears throat> you look at sort of the complete and utter implosion of what's going on in Dallas on top of the injuries to their kind of headline players. Uh, he obviously took some important pieces with him <laughs> to Washington and uh, his specific ability to coordinate, I think is pretty obvious with this sort of two two sided uh, um, observational data we've gotten so far from this season. So uh, he deserves to be the favorite. He should probably be shorter than plus 180. If you made me make a bet right now, I'd probably just bet Dan Quinn. I think he should probably be uh, in the 40 percent chance to win range. Uh, and I would give I would kind of reserve 10% for something that we just don't see coming yet. Uh, and then I would uh, kind of lump the rest of the uh, probability into the uh, the um, Dan Campbell and Andy Reid bucket with a, uh, a little sprinkle of Sean Payton and Kevin O'Connell there just because, you know, there's there's they're still close enough and there is enough anchoring. So, um, yeah, I think Dan Quinn should be about 40% to win this one. And, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd very much just like to see uh, the Chiefs just take a loss and we can rule Andy Reid out. <laughs> and then Dan Cam- Campbell uh, is kind of the only guy that could potentially run him down. 
Yeah, the way I look at this market is so right now I make uh, I make Dan Quinn minus one ten to win twelve oh, wow. plus games. Wow. So I think that's where the market has to start is, and also like I think he can he can certainly win at eleven and six. And yeah, people might say that you know if he's eleven and six and he's closed the season four and four, uh, he'll have lost all his momentum. Like mm-hmm. look what happened to Brian Dable. Like Brian Dable barely won games in the second half of the season, and he finished nine seven and one. Look at like Stefanski. The first time he won, they wilted down the stretch a bit from memory with the Browns, and they finished like eleven and five or something. Um, and you know they lost the division down the stretch, and he still won going away. Uh, and so I think that the thing is, is that when you have such a strong platform and foundation to your case, like Quinn does, like Quinn has seven and two banked. Like it's kind of ridiculous that the yeah. command seven and two, but they have banked that. And this season now for the Commanders, if they win eleven games or more and make the playoffs. It is guaranteed to have good vibes. And the thing is, and the thing I learned from Dayball is that even if you scuttle scuttle a bit to the end of the season, you just need the one win to clinch the playoffs for all the vibes to come back. Dayball won coach of the year off of the back of beating Sam Ellinger at home. Like that was his momentous victory. And Dan Quinn, the thing with Quinn and the commanders now, um, so bring up their schedule is like, it's not that hard. Like they have all these gimmies still on the schedule. They have, home Tennessee, they have at New Orleans, they play Dallas twice, they have home games against Pittsburgh and Atlanta, which aren't gimmies, but again, they're two and a half point favorites home to Pittsburgh. I think they'll be favored at home against Atlanta. Um, And then the other two games on the schedule are the Philadelphia games, which are huge. And, you know, the Philadelphia, I think, are the superior team, but modal outcome there is splitting them. So you just look through it. And I think that Quinn, if he gets to 12 and 5, uh, like you, know, you can never speak in absolutes about an award that is as abstract as this one. But my sense is, is that if Quinn goes from four wins to 12 and five and the defense continues to look, you know, competent, which was the one potential flaw in his case, mm-hmm. um, then I just don't think he's going to lose unless Andy Reid goes 17 and 0 or something like that. Or if Dan Campbell runs the slate and goes 16 and one, like I think if he's 12 and five, um, it, or if he's twelve and five, or he wins the division, and those things may well be coupled. But if he wins the division eleven and six, like I think that Quinn should be, uh, I would still make him a dog against the field, but I think it's very close. Um, what do you think is a stronger case? Do you think that Andy Reid at let's say sixteen and one, or Dan Campbell as a fifteen and two one seed? So say that they both go. Um, and I make Reed 16 and one slightly more likely than Campbell 15 and two, but just those two cases against each other with both teams having one loss the rest of the way, who do you think would win just that head to head strip Quinn out of it? Some of it's going to be sequence based. When does the loss happen for the chiefs? Yeah. Is it now <laughs> or is it, you know, is it, uh, you know, the very end when, you know, they're not playing for much, um, that but it's going to impact things, but uh, in the vacuum, I'd say fifteen and two. Dan Campbell is a better story. Um, Andy Reid's won this award once. I've completely spaced on this, but he did win it with uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, he was not a consideration with a one-loss Chiefs team. So um, I think there's a little bit of precedent there to look at, and I think that just in general, um, you know, the when the voting, unless the Chiefs are seventeen and zero, making history. When the votes come around, I think it's going to be tough for a lot of people to really want to reward this Chiefs team considering the way they're getting it done doesn't really feel like (laughs) dominance. It feels pretty fluky. And maybe that in and of itself is just reason not to even really think that they can get it done, that they will stub their toe at some point. They will have, you know, the the loss to the Broncos where Pat Mahomes gets up and he's sick on a given Sunday. And who knows? Like, uh, you know, that that kind of stuff could uh, ultimately just happen and should happen probably will happen um and so i think uh, uh i'm i'm more willing to look at uh, dan campbell as the outsider of consequence than i am looking at uh andy reed yeah i think that's reasonable I, like ultimately the, the i think the biggest factor is that one of the guys has patrick mahomes as his quarterback and the other guy <laughs> right. has Jared Goff, <laughs> yeah, um, sure. and the other guy has won um, three Super Bowls with Kansas City. Uh, one guy has, and then the other guy is would if he gets to fifteen and two, it's the greatest season in Detroit Lions history. Um, and there's just a lot of narrative there. Um, the thing is, though, is and what might give Reed the edge over Campbell to me is that 
Reed has this like kind of six percent trump card in his pocket of potentially going seventeen and zero, which and that I think at that yeah. point it kind of that that's probably checkmate. Like probably like Dan Quinn at that point um, might have to go fourteen and three and win the division or whatever to be able to beat a perfect season. Um, so yeah, that that is the one thing that is on Reed's side. So. Yeah, I think Reed at nine to one, that type of range. I think that's a reasonable bet. We're recording this before the Chiefs have lost by thirty points to the Bucks and rendered all. <laughs> um, but assuming that they win, let's sure it's their nine point favorites. That would um, be something. Yeah, I would bucket this as Quinn tier one by himself, Campbell and Reed. You can debate the order in tier two, and then a big drop off. And there are other guys like, yeah, if Kevin O'Connell, who's nine to one in the market to get the one seed, sure. Mm -hmm. Say he's perfectly live to win the award, but right now his coach of the year price is shorter than that, and I think that is what he would probably mm. need to win. Um, Jonathan Gannon is 18 to 1, which um, is so crazy. A to part where well, there's a huge delta between that and his like division price, but like the team's five and four. Like, when I mean, what, what does Jonathan Gannon actually have to do to win? Does because I don't think like 11 and 6 division winner like i wouldn't be taking that over the field when quinn exists when reed and campbell exist like yeah it could win but he might have to go you know have one loss the rest of the way before you're taking him over the field so um he's another candidate who's interesting but yeah i think that it, it's probably going to be one of those top three guys unless you get weird stuff like you know mike tomlin going 14 and three and all, yeah. all the fleur storm, storms back and goes undefeated from Raheem Wally. morris is probably in the mix too because their schedule is so easy if they just went out uh he'll get some consideration i, I assume uh can i ask you just a, a red team question about the dan quinn bull case yeah. um the advanced stats don't love this defense at all no it's not cool. I don't <laughs> know. that makes sense yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, is that it, when the first month of the season, it, there was – Quinn's case was – I think it was still very strong, but it was a little uneasy because it was all – It was the all Daniels, Daniels show yeah. and The defense was a disaster. Now there is this notion that he has lifted the defense to competence, and it has been competent the past four or five weeks or whatever, and even if it is a below-average defense the rest of the way – so long as it's not a calamity, I think he's probably baked in enough narrative with the idea that he's changed the culture, he's he's doing defensive stuff and making mm -hmm. the defense do enough to succeed. Um, and then Jaden Daniels is there in the offense and he hired Cliff Kingsbury and he's empowered the staff and all this kind of stuff. Like ultimately, the story I think will just kind of fill itself in around the record with this one. Like if they go to if they go from four wins to twelve, it's also like he's done this with the Commanders. Like it's not like he's taken over right. um, perennially successful franchise and restored them to like the Commanders have been an absolute clown show for like two and a half decades or whatever. The fact that this will be, you know, the RG three season was magical, but outside of that, this will be the best Commanders season since like. I don't know what they won Super Bowl in '91. Like it's a long time, and yeah, the Mark like, Griffin era, yeah. the Snyder era, and all that. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that he should be okay. Um, Pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, since Week Four, the uh, Commanders' pass defense is uh, top three in the NFL, and that includes a sample where they played Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson. <laughs> so yeah. this isn't even necessarily cherry picking when they were playing bad quarterbacks, although there there are plenty of bad quarterbacks in that sample too. Um, but there's plenty of bad quarterbacks left on their schedule. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hair nervous that the bottom falls out for the commander's defense and that could hurt him, but we'll see. Yeah. I think the, the one thing though, is that the linebackers are good in Louvu and, and Bobby Wagner I think that um, Johnny Newton has really turned the corner um, playing sure. a defensive tackle. He was banged up to start the season, playing inconsistent snaps. Then when Allen went down, he's come in. He's been really good two weeks in a row. Um, the secondary isn't good, but I don't think it's like the tire fire that like the Bucks are outside of Antoine Winfield at the moment. Um, and, you know, guys like – they're not big names at all, but guys like Dorrance Armstrong and Dante Fowler, like they're effective pass rushers. Um, so I think there is enough there that they can be not great, but not um, not an embarrassment. I think that, that will hopefully be enough for Quinn, um, someone selfishly involved. All right, let's jump to Offensive Player of the Year. Um, this market, I think now, is pretty much three people. Derek Henry is minus 145, the favorite Saquon Barkley is plus 250, Justin Jefferson plus 725, 
And then there's a massive drop off to Jamar Chase at 30 to 1, CeeDee Lamb and Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, the same price as well. Um, do you think that the gap should be as big as it is between Henry and Saquon? No, I think that should probably be a little narrower. Um, it's going to fluctuate, uh, but I do think the gap should be bigger between Henry Barkley and the rest of the comers. Um, Jefferson being 725 is a little bit of a head scratcher, honestly. He's having a down year and like not even really moving the needle when you watch the games, as far as I can tell you. So, like, I still I hold him high as my, you know, top three wide receiver in terms of just player rating, but, uh, I don't know that he's doing enough this year to warrant that much. That strong consideration is the top wide out should probably be chased at the top among the wide receivers because I'm guessing Lamb's going to miss some time. Jefferson, for whatever his reason is, he's going to lose some uh, some target share too with Hawkinson getting more involved and the uh, emergence of Addison. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, Barkley and Henry, I think, should be closer. Would make it like tie by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I think Henry should be a, a slight favorite over Barkley instead of a, a meaningful favorite. And uh, uh, I think that uh, yeah, the the Eagles' uh, offense has been much better with him involved. I was not correct about that. I thought the boom and bust nature of what Henry brought to that um, equation was going to ultimately be a negative for the Eagles, who were able to do it so predictably and methodically and get get themselves into advantageous down and distance and uh but you know his explosive the boom part of the boomer bust that comes with Barkley is is pretty obvious and the uh you know the standout highlight plays are are just otherworldly and those tend to resonate and he's going to win people their fantasy leagues and people are going to want to vote for him for OPOY and that's just the way this goes uh meanwhile Henry I think is going to get a little bit of um you know, he, he number one, he's losing a little bit of uh, the attention because of Lamar Jackson's superlative play. Number two, he's losing specifically touches and touchdowns and opportunity to Lamar Jackson through the air and on the ground. Um, and uh, I think in general, if the if the Ravens are smart, uh, they may continue to kind of ramp down his usage through the end of the season so that he is uh, fresh for the playoffs when they are going to need the two headed attack we've seen for the last month at full strength. You made a little harsh on Jefferson. I think Jefferson's been pretty good. He's, <laughs> he's 66 receiving yards clear of the field, and he's got a game in hand. Um, he hasn't had like the massive JJ games of 190 yards and 15 targets, but they've also been leading a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, Sam Donald's just not an amazing quarterback as well, which is the other issue for him. Um, but I think that – I think Jefferson probably – is up against it because just how strong the two running backs are. So right. I I think that um, I would have Saquon and Henry as tier one, and I would have Jefferson as tier two, and then I'd have a drop off. Um, I kind of wax and wane buying in or not on the idea that a quarterback could win this award. I think there are worlds still where one quarterback could win it, and that's Lamar. If he falls out a little bit of the MVP race, but he goes back to or he keeps on putting up video game numbers, first player ever to go 4K, 1K. And if he's not going to win MVP because, you know, they take a couple of losses or whatever, they end up as an 11-6 wild card, which is very much in play. And then there is a kind of swirling content uh, revolution where people are like, are we not going to reward the best season of Lamar Jackson's career? Are we going to give Derrick Henry Offensive Player of the Year over Lamar when we all agree that Lamar um, is the straw that stirs the drink? I like. I don't. Uh, there are worlds where that can happen. I just don't think it's particularly likely. I think it'll just be Henry or Saquon who win the award. I'm with you. I would have Henry as the slight favorite over Saquon. I'd have the gap a little bit narrower, but I wouldn't be rushing to back Saquon at current price. No. Mainly because Derrick Henry is about to play the Bengals rush defense on prime time on Thursday. Uh -huh. so, um, <laughs> I would make, uh, any bet. I can't get involved with Henry at minus 145 either. Um, just with how long there is left in the season, the attrition at running back, all of that. So yeah. just kind of wait and see what happens on Thursday night um, before doing anything in that market. Um, I don't think there's any real long shot bet to make um if you do believe in lamar and the idea that the quarterback would win that's probably the direction i would go um if Bijan robinson starts ripping off uh who he had a very he healthy work share 
um, against the Cowboys. If he was to become like, you know, 80% of the carries consistently and can kind of um, just bridge the gap a little bit with a couple of long burst burst break runs, then maybe you can get back into it. But I think it's just going to be Henry or Barkley uh, who likely wins this one. All right. Uh, before we get to the NBA, it's a showdown in the Lone Star State this Sunday night. Drew watched Jared Goff in the Lions take on CJ Stroud and the Texans as both teams fight for playoff position down the back stretch of the season. Coverage starts at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. As you all know by now, we've teamed up with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all our picks, and we'll have special offers for our listeners each week. If you haven't signed up to BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE, and you'll get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using bonus code BETEDGE. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game and you'll receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your first bet loses. Just make sure you use bonus code BETEDGE when you sign up. See BetMGM.com for terms, 21 plus only. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, available in the U.S. Call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369 in New York. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona, 1-800-327-5050 in Massachusetts, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-981-0023 in Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only, subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE and get your $1,500 first bet offer today. Okay, National Basketball Association, mm. before we get out of here, um, biggest early first impressions, Drew, on the NBA season? Well, uh, like we thought, the Celtics are in a class by themselves in the East. I think that's very fair. Um, I, I will note, though, that the Cavaliers have uh, absolutely been meaningfully impressive, but it looks like to me at least by eye is regular season success more likely than it is making them live in a playoff series. Uh, and I also think that the fully cooked version of the Knicks is interesting in the playoff series. So I think you have, you know, you have two realistic runners uh, in the East behind the Celtics. And then like we thought the, uh, the West is a three team race, but not the three teams we thought <laughs> the, uh, uh, the Warriors being an absolute truck, to this point in the season is amazing. I was high as I was on any team coming into this year on the Warriors based on their depth. They've lost Steph Curry. The narrative at, in the moment was, well, without Curry, what well, his offense is going to completely fall apart. Uh, it, it, Steve Kerr, who I've never especially loved as a coach, is just hitting all the right buttons, putting together lineups and rotations that are fun and interesting and different and tough, tough to defend. Um, and yeah, they uh, them being... Uh, ahead of the Thunder right now in net rating is amazing. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe it's somewhat opponent driven because simple rating system would have them behind the Thunder. But uh, the Thunder are as good as advertised. The Warriors are going to be a huge problem for someone to match up with in the in the postseason, I think. Um, and uh, I like what I'm seeing from Budenholzer and the Suns. Uh, the Suns team, I think, as, again, if, assuming that they stay healthy and they're at full strength, they're, uh, uh, they're a really fun regular season too regular season team also um i think the nuggets are in deep trouble of slipping into the uh the play-in mix i think the um uh the philadelphia sixers 76ers are in humongous amount of trouble i don't know what is going on there and how they're gonna uh be able to turn this around if they're not going to be able to get 60 games out of uh, uh Embiid and paul george so that that is very much worth watching um and uh yeah and the bucks uh probably your most disappointing team of the season so far considering that they they have been relatively relatively healthy and yet uh they have not been especially competitive yeah indeed yeah i agree with all of that i think honestly the best bet at the moment is just betting on the thunder to win the west um still some plus 300 yeah, about like i think that's just going to close <laughs> I, I think they're just going to be like plus 150 plus 160 come playoff time if they're healthy i think they're just they're a tier above everyone else and i suspect that they're at the level where whoever the second best team in the West is, like the Thunder, I think they're just going to be like six and a half point favorites at home in those matchups against whoever that team is, whether it's uh, whether it's Dallas or Minnesota or... I think the Warriors are interesting because I think they're more of a regular season merchant because of their just insane depth. I'm not sure mm -hmm. they have the high-end outcomes 
um, in the playoffs to beat um, certainly Oklahoma City and then perhaps even Dallas, Minnesota, that's arguable. Nuggets are just a mess at the moment, though uh, Jokic is as good as ever. Mm-hmm. Um, let's close out with the coach of the year market. Kenny Atkinson is the favorite at plus 450. JJ Redick plus 600. Joe Mazzulla plus 600. Mike Budenholzer seven to one. Um, I think, as always, with these types of markets, it's important to just envision like what is the actual win condition for the coach? Like what mm-hmm. kind of level do they need to get to where they're a viable chance of winning? And then kind of figuring out what is the fair price of getting to that level and how that reconciles to their price in the market. Um, and that's why I just think that JJ Reddick is just taking up way too much of this market <laughs> because like realistically, what I know everyone loves Reddick, um, but it's like, what does he actually need to do to win? Does he need to be like a 55 win two seed or something? And that's longer than plus 600 to happen. Um, there are probably like, you're probably better off at that point betting, you know, Anthony Davis at three times the price to win MVP or something. So that's probably the type of outcomes that um, he would need to win. But what do you think about this market? Um, what's your favorite bet? I think there's a 54 win three seed Lakers case for Reddick, but I agree. I think that's probably sure. the, kind of the, the most difficult price for me to swallow as I look at the board. Um, I kind of want to make a case for a repeat here, man. <laughs> Dude, yeah, the, the, thunder, than people the, think. the thunder aren't even shooting well <laughs> right now like if they get a hot from you know for a stretch shooting wise like they're this this could be you know 73 win warriors type of run for them like they're they are that good um and so it's uh i think that's worth keeping an eye on uh dagano going back to back here as 25 to 1 has me intrigued yeah i mean obviously he's going to be held to an extremely high standard um, after what they win 57 games last year and were yeah. the one seed. But yeah, if they like sniff 70 wins, then it'll get loud for Dag now. And he may need that. But, you know, even if he's like, if he's 69 and 13 and the Celtics have an injury or whatever and he finishes seven wins clear of the field, then um, I think that's that's very much in play. I do think that the market is correct in having Atkinson as the favorite. I think he is the single most likely coach to win sure. um, just because it's just a super clean case. Um, he has scope to improve by 10 plus wins, be a top two seed. And I think the best thing that he has going for him is that it's pretty much the entire same team as it was last year and it looks different. Um, so the coaching is very easy to point to. The idea that you know he's revolutionized the offense, that he's getting more out of Mobley, um, and that this team has taken a leap forward after a couple of years of kind of looking like the same team. Um, so I think that he just ticks the most boxes, and he is um, the most likely, the single most likely guy to win the plus four fifty. I don't think there's very much meat on the bone. Mm-hmm. Um, any long shot, any kind of wild name you want to throw out? Ah, uh, man. I mean, all of the kind of buzz I had for sort of the teams that were under the radar that I thought could make top two seed type of uh, uh, type of noise uh, have fizzled because of injury or, or, you know, like the Magic, for instance, was a good yeah. example. Um, and, uh, you know, as you look at it now, like it's going to be tough for a guy like Kerr to break through, even though, again, I'm very impressed with what he's doing. Um, Budenholzer, uh, I do think is live, but at seven to one, I don't think there's a ton of margin there to be bet into. Um, and uh, um, as you go just way, way, way down the list, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really not seeing uh, the likelihood that there's uh, a jump forward from anybody. And um, I mean, you know, my, my numbers say that the, you know, teams like the Rockets are still underrated, but it, uh, very tough to see how Ime Udoka gets kind of a public, you know, campaign of support here. Um, my numbers also suggest that, uh, um, you know, the Mavericks are are better than, you know, currently they're, they're being rated. But uh, again, you know, when you have a player like Doncic on the team, if the Mavericks do well enough, like they just give Doncic the MVP and, uh, you know, the coach gets forgotten about. So, you know, I, I think, uh, I think you're right. Kenny Atkinson belongs at the top, but uh, sort of the outlier case for me is going to be Degano winning uh, 70 games with this Thunder team and uh, being the guy. Because, like, you know, if the as bullish as I was on the Thunder coming into the year and the last couple of years <laughs> and lost a lot of money on them in the playoffs trying to get them home in the West, um, it uh, it's pretty unbelievable right now that they could 
get more wins than the Celtics. And as I look at their schedule and as I'm rating this team, I think it's viable. Yeah. I think the other thing too is that people conflate this award a little bit with the NFL award, which the NFL award seems to have become like bad team goes to slightly above average and yeah. that just doesn't really win in the NBA. Now there have been examples like Tom Thibodeau won that year with the Knicks, but like that team outperformed its win total by like 20 wins and was in New York and he like turned Julius Randle into an all NBA player. Like it was just, that was an insane case. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas for the most part, it's teams that go good to great. And that's why like Atkinson um, is super clean. Why, you know, Budenholzer, if they improve by 10 wins and there's a lot of coaching you can point to in there, uh, you know, high fifties win two seed, like that's a pretty solid case. Um, Udoka, like Udoka's case is obviously, and everything around him is a bit um, messy, but he would also fit the profile of going, you know, if they were, I don't think it's going to happen, but if they were to become a low 50s win team, he would satisfy yeah. most of the team aspects. Like where it doesn't win is like, you know, the Hornets going from expected 30 win team that goes 42 and 40. Like that would have more of a chance in the NFL, probably still wouldn't win, but would that be more live? Whereas, in this environment, like in, for just this award, it just doesn't really work. So I think that you're looking for teams that have potential to be a top two, three seed. The one guy I'd keep an eye on is um, if the Magic start, like if they can just kind of tread water and keep within distance of the two seed, um, mm-hmm. where when Paolo comes back, like if the Magic were to get the two seed um, with Paolo having missed, you know, six weeks, that would be a pretty um, incredible case for Jamal Mosley, but I think they don't, I don't think they're going to stay in touch with the two seed with how grim um, the offense looks at the moment without Paolo. But again, that's just one to monitor. All right. We are done for today. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. If you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. For myself and Drew, we'll see you tomorrow.